Welcome to Data Cloud Now, where we bring you the latest in all things data in business and industry. I'm joined by Alex Isidorchev, founder of Cybersun. Such a pleasure to have you on the program. Thanks for having me. Alex, so great to have you on the program. Let's start at the beginning. Growing up, you were a lover of video games. How did these games help you start thinking about the impact data will have on society? Well, great to be here. Um, and I was a lover of video games, but a certain type of video game in particular. Um, I loved real-time strategy. So for those of us who grew up playing the Sim Cities of the world, Age of Empires, that sort of game, the city building game, that was, that was kind of how I spent my years as a preteen. And in those games, you're managing an economy and sort of running an economy from a top-down point of view, and you have a bunch of information. And you know, I was sort of naively believed that this is actually what mayors do, <laughs> that mayors actually run cities by sort of looking at a panorama of all the different data points that their city is doing and then sort of reacting to that. In real time. In real time. And um, you actually have an incredible amount of data that's being simulated when you play SimCity. Much of that data parallels what the US Census or the PLS would put out, except it's just continuous. Um, and so that's what kind of started off, me off on sort of the journey. And I knew I wanted to do that, um, but I wasn't sure what that was exactly yet. That came later. You know, let's move on in your, in your personal journey. You know, fast forward, you went to Wharton right out of college. You joined the hedge fund Co2. Why did you decide to go that route and spend over six years running their, their data science? And what were some of your greatest takeaways? Yeah, so I wouldn't say it was all planned. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I would start with a piece of advice I watched uh, from the founder of Co2 right before I took the internship there. And he sort of gave this advice to young people that I would pass on much in a video like this, which was to do one thing that's conventional uh, and one thing that's unconventional in your early 20s. And so I think what was conventional for me was to go to Wharton, get a degree from Wharton, sort of you know, focus on finance, get onto Wall Street like a lot of my peers were doing, and Co2 was a great brand already, and so that was very conventional. I think what was unconventional was I knew how to code, I was interested in data science, and when I got to Co2, I was really interested in finding a way to make data science work and sort of change their business. Um, they were a discretionary investing firm, and so to be able to come in and sort of say, hey, how about we use data in a sort of money ball fashion? We'll get to that later. I think that was the unconventional part. And I took that advice to heart. So I would sort of pass that on um, to anybody who watches this. I appreciate, appreciate the advice and the guidance you're giving to the audience. You know, over that period of time, when did the concept really of deep background in unique content, content sets really take hold for you? So I think in asset management, the concept of using data was not new when I got to the industry in the sense that there were quant funds and there were discretionary funds, but there was sort of nothing in between. And I think when I got there, the industry was just starting to realize that, hey, you could use quantitative techniques and external data sets to make detailed decisions. And I think what was lacking and what, what frankly is still a major uh, challenge is finding folks that are both technical and have domain knowledge. So you sort of have the business folks. It's kind of the kind magic of, combination, if you will. Exactly, because you have the business folks who sort of know what they want, they have the domain knowledge, but then you also have the technology folks who sort of know how to manipulate the data, but you need something in between. And it, it's, it's a little bit parallel to how Snowflake has made an effort to build sort of vertical segments, where Snowflake used to be a IT purchasing decision, and now it's sort of a strategic decision for a given sector, for a given industry. And I think um, the unique vantage point you have in asset management is you get to invest in a lot of different sectors. Right. So you learn about CPG, you learn about mining, you learn industry about- industry experts in everything. In everything, touching, so right. you learn about every industry and what data pertains to every industry, but then you also need to be able to manipulate that data. And I think that that um, sort of unique component is when I sort of realized, hey look, there's all these specific data content sets that need to be translated and sort of made relevant to, at the time, asset management, but I think more broadly um, could be useful for all types of data science practitioners. You know, that takes us to present day 2022. You know, I love the founder story and, and I have to ask, when did you decide, hey, it's time to start something new, I have something here, and what were your founding principles for Cyberson? Well, so I think that throughout my time at Co2, I, as a customer of data vendors, knew that there was something lacking, that there could be a better data vendor and there could be a better way. 
but I didn't really have a plan. When I left Co2, I mostly wanted a vacation. I'd been there a very long time. I needed a little bit of a break. And so when I took time off so the spring of 2022, there was actually a lot of interesting private equity activity going on around the Nielsen IQs, the NPDs, the IRIs, these sort of established old school data firms that had been around for a long time and been very successful. And I became interested in that, what I call data as a service space. And that's sort of where the idea started bubbling up. Um, as a Snowflake user and customer, when the data marketplace was released, it really changed things a lot for how we were using data at Co2. I've sort of talked about that um, at other places in a more Co2 specific context. And that inspired an idea that, hey, look, this is a different delivery mechanism, and this could do for data sales um, what sort of software as a service did for software sales. And that's where the sort of DAS comes from. You know, I want to tie back to an earlier comment. You referenced Moneyball, and I've heard you mention, you know, the Moneyballization of every industry in the use of external data. Can you elaborate a little bit on this and how will Cyberson fill this void for years to come? Right. Well, first, a pointed piece of advice. Second piece of unsolicited advice. If you haven't watched Moneyball, you should watch it. Very rewatchable as well. Very rewatchable. The movie came out when I was a freshman in college, and it really is what set me on the journey to say, okay, whatever they're doing, I don't care about baseball. I'm a hockey fan, but that's kind of what I want to be doing. So that, that was where the phrase Moneyball came from. I think what I mean when I say the Moneyballization of everything is, is sort of two distinct things. First, and sort of obviously I mean, every industry can sort of use analytics or sort of use structured analytical decision making as opposed to gut feel to be a little bit more accurate. So if you watch Moneyball, it's about essentially a data scientist convincing a bunch of old school baseball scouts that they can do their job a little bit more analytically. So I think that's the first piece when I say Moneyballization of everything mm -hmm. is that as that data scientist, that technical person moves upward in their career and sort of joins eventually the C-suite, that person acquires kind of that domain knowledge and can sort of help make decisions, not just be an IT function. So I think that's part one. I think part two that often goes unrecognized is the availability of data to actually start making those kind of decisions before we can get to, here's how you can drive your business with algorithms or ML or rule-based algorithms or anything. You need the data need in the, the first place. Information, exactly. and I, right, and I think in baseball, in Moneyball, they had the fantastic fortune where they actually had great data going back decades. Right? But no you, one was making But nobody was it. using exactly. it, right? So you had people <laughs> who could say like, oh, did you know this person was the first person to do X, Y, Z since somebody else in 1922, right? Baseball was Your kind mind's of, blown when you hear that. You're like, how is that possible? Right, because <laughs> of these discrete events in baseball, they kind of had this great data. And I think the, the big difference in, in, in a lot of industries is you, you don't have that data or you weren't collecting it or, the, or, or it's not easily available or it's not commercially available. And I think that before we can sort of get to driving the world more analytically, we need to find data sources in the first place. You know, I want to pull this back to Snowflake a little bit, you know, as you make this next step, how do companies like Snowflake help the integration of data, make it easier, cost effective for founders and companies like yours? Well, I, I mentioned this earlier. I think Snowflake in some ways, and the Snowflake data marketplace and data sharing features in particular, will do the same thing for data as SaaS did for software. Um, and this is where the term DAS comes from. So the ease with which customers can transfer and share data and providers like Cybersyn can essentially provide data um, changes everything. We can upload a content set in a listing and update that content set without the customer doing anything. You know, that traditional data sale where you negotiate a contract, you set up an FTP, if the schema changes or if there's additional tables, you have to have a follow-up call conversation, all that is gone because suddenly my table is your table. So I can update my table, my schema, my listing, what have you, and you sort of benefit from that. Christian Kleinerman, the uh, SVP of product here at Snowflake, gave a great analogy. It's like the iPhone um, where you install an app and a data listing is like an app that you install and can sort of update on its own. And I think that's what Snowflake does to data sales. And that's what creates, I think, a DAS category as distinct from just selling data. You know, Alex, it's an exciting next chapter for yourself. Looking forward to seeing what's next for Cyberson. You know, any final remarks you'd like to deliver? Right, well, I think to, to sort of wrap it up, I would just say that, you know, we have the capability to see the world's economy in real time. If you could go behind every company's firewall right now, right, you can measure US GDP minute by minute. There should never be a question wow. of making 
you know, the wrong economic decision. If you're the CEO of a major company, if your competitor knows what inflation is today, how could you not want to know the same information? So the question just is about now execution, and Snowflake is sort of what enables that execution. Well, Alex, thank you so much for joining me on the program. I'm Ryan Green with Data Cloud Now. We'll see you soon. Thank <music> you.